Unit four, Iran. Here is a look at what is now modern Iran, but we have to pay attention again to the changes um, before what we have today in modern Iran uh, and look a little bit at the uh, Islamic Revolution. So just kind of a quick map of Iran where it is there. Capital is Tehran. Looking at some of the resources, which is very important in this country, and the, mostly the oil. So first off, understanding the uh, religion aspect behind Iran. Uh, we have Shiites, or individuals who practice a Shiism brand of Islam. Um, it's different from what the majority of Muslims practice, which is the Sunni Muslims. Uh, when Muhammad died, uh, the Shiite Muslims uh, wanted the role of the leader to be passed to Muhammad's brother-in-law. However, the Sunnis wanted to choose the caliph or the person that's kind of acting um, in that role from the accepted leadership. So, the, And they have this idea as all, also of the last imam, uh, which is the heir to the throne. Uh, they feel it disappeared as a child and became known as the hidden imam. So when Shiite Iran was formed, its ruler would lead um, until that hidden imam re returned. So there's a little bit of a difference between the two factions. When you look at the past of Iran, we have a constitution that was created in 1906. Uh, the constitution was modeled after a lot of the Western constitutions in the world. They had direct elections, they had branches with separation of powers, uh, laws were made by a legislative branch. Uh, they had the idea of and concept of popular sovereignty. They gave protections uh, for freedom of expression under a Bill of Rights and, and protection for those that were accused with crimes. And they had a majlis, so this legislative branch, um, or their assembly, their parliament, uh, and seats were taken up by all walks of life, Jews, Christians, all different religions and people. However, uh, in 1923, there's a coup attempt and a coup that uh, took over Iran. This was by Reza Pahlavi, okay, and he took over in 1923. He pushed for more westernization, uh, except for the political aspect. So um, he had the idea of uh, a bureaucracy, more women's education, getting rid of um, the hijab, but he did not give them um, political rights. They were more eroded. Um, the press, the media, the Majlis legislative branch lost a lot of the power. So that Shah name, uh, that is a title given to emperor or kings, and that's what he was called. But in 1951, uh, post-World War II, the Majlis then finally regained power. Um, Muhammad Mozadi uh, was the Prime Minister of Iran. Uh, he decided to nationalize the foreign oil companies, which angered a lot of outside organizations, especially British oil companies. Uh, what he did, he came in and got rid of all the corrupt military officials. He forced the Shah out into exile. However, he was overthrown by a CIA, CIA operation coup, and the Shah, which then at that time was supported by a lot of Western nations like the United States, returned to power. So under um, Reza Pahlavi in, from 1953 to 1979, uh, we have some westernization going on, um, some western reforms and ties with the West, but most of the people that he uh, is ruling do live in poverty. Uh, and he used what was known as the Savak, which was an organization um, that would go out and kind of um, arrest people that were against him, terrorize people, secret kind of operations. Under Iran, what's really important is this idea of a rentier state. So a rentier state, uh, is, like it says, a term in political science and international relations theory used to classify those states which derive all or a substantial portion of their national revenues from the rent of indigenous resources to external clients. So their uh, natural resource that is really important is oil. The companies from outside of Iran come in, rent the land, pay Iran for that land, and then 
they use that oil and sell it uh, through their company. So Iran Shah relied heavily on those foreign oil companies uh, and that helped finance the government. So what was nice, he did not have to run any taxes to run things. So what that means also, he doesn't have to please the people either because he doesn't have to rely on them. So here's kind of a look of how uh, he dressed. Uh, in 1963, at the White Revolution, uh, the Shah's reform program to fix things within the nation, uh, land reform, 90% of Iran's peasants became landowners, so giving them that ownership of uh, that land. Uh, they had a massive government and financed heavy industry products, uh, projects, so trying to get the government involved in the industrial world. Gave women the right to vote and more political power. Uh, poured government money into education, especially those rural areas. They had a very high illiteracy rate, um, so they wanted to improve that. They had this idea of profit sharing for industrial workers, too. So kind of an incentive plan um, to provide direct or indirect payments to employees that depend on companies' profitability in addition to employees' regular salary and bonuses. So if they work hard and their business is doing well that they work in, they'll get some bonuses there. Uh, and then they nationalized forests and pasture lands. Here's a look with the connection with some American presidents. Again, supported the Shah was, again with Jimmy Carter. But this was not well liked throughout uh, the country, especially by a lot of religious figures. So here comes the Iranian Revolution. Uh, and the reason the Shah fell and the people did not support him was because the Shah was spending a lot of that money on the oil. Uh, for mi military hardware and the government, not on the people, right? It wasn't investing back in the Iranian economy. Religious leaders angered the Shah for too much westernization, not uh, any Islamic roots there. A lot of government co co uh, corruption, especially the Savak, and the Shah's constitutional violations of basic human rights, so violating those personal rights. So you have some protests there by anti-Shah individuals. A lot of those people included oil field workers. They feel like they're being manipulated and used. Intellectuals, middle class businessmen, uh, Iranian nationalists who feel he's too Western, and then the clerics, the Muslim clerics. Uh, those are kind of like priests uh, in that religious sense. So death to Shah, kind of against U.S. imperialism. The Shah was then forced to release leave in 1979. So what happened is that the Ayatollah, Ayatollah uh, Khomeini takes over. Uh, Ayatollah uh, means kind of like supreme leader, uh, ruler. Uh, he's a religious figure and he led the revolution. Uh, he was uh, kind of kicked out of the country but he returned in February, February of 1979. So his background again, he was a scholar studying um, one of the more important cities uh, in Iran, Qam, uh, where a lot of these clerics study, uh, began to speak out against the Shah in the 1960s. Again, he was arrested and he was forced to leave to go to France uh, because of this. Uh, he is a fundamentalist, Shia Islamic fundamentalist. He hated Iranian elite individuals, hate Western ideas, especially in the American ways. Um, and he practiced jurist guardianship or of the idea of vile a faji, which is kind of the principle that um, gave these senior clerics broad authority, uh, the idea that uh, has all encompassing authority over the community based on this Sharia law. Uh, Khomeini uh, claimed that the true meaning uh, give the clergy authority over that Shiite community. Again, in Iran, the Shiites are the dominant or the majority. So because of this revolution and the success, a theocracy is created. Those Savak individuals, those individuals that worked under the Shah, were uh, taken. They were prosecuted. There's kind of the fate of a lot of the Shah's generals. They were handled as well. And the goal of the revolution, again, is purify the country from secular values and beliefs and practice under this theocracy. Uh, we have may heard about the American embassy takeover in Tehran and the 440 days, 44 days and 52 American hostages that were held. 
and Jimmy Carter really couldn't do much about it. Uh, he was very unsuccessful dealing with this hostage situation, which hurt uh, his presidency, and they were released then in 1981. So we now have the Islamic Republic of Iran. They created a constitution in 1979. Uh, it does not serve the individual, but again, it's the purpose to guide people towards Allah. Uh, again, practicing this theocracy. Allah is sovereign over the Iranian people and the state. All matters, so all civil, penal, financial, economic, administrative, cultural, military, political, and other laws must be based on Islamic criteria following that Islamic law. Rule of, uh, of law is hearsay as it is God's law or Sharia that it should reign superior. Again, following Sharia law, which is the religious law. So under uh, the Khomeini revolution, uh, liberals were removed from universities. They want more conservatives. Uh, the new government suppressed all opposition, so a lot of pressure of any other political parties or aspects of the government, and hinders civil society. Uh, many were executed, again, in the name of that revolution. So when you get to um, women in Iran, uh, the hijab was also then put back, and it's part of their values that needs to be followed. Here's kind of a, a way to look at it. There was a dictatorship under the Shah, but now it's kind of a new dictatorship, just different type of dictatorship in the way they do things and where their foundation is for their government. Uh, they do support, uh, they did support the Palestinian cause. Again, there's uh, Hamas and Hezbollah, uh, terrorist organizations, uh, military wings, political wings. Again, um, they support certain movements. There's Shia Islamic political parties and militant groups. Uh, there's in the past they had the Iran Iraq war that lasted for about eight years. And there's some disputes there on the border. A lot of individuals and in support from both sides. United States dealing with Saddam Hussein in 1983. About 375,000 Iraqi casualties and 60,000 prisoners of war, 1 million Iranian casualties. So there's a conflict there that they had to deal with. Since the death of the first Ayatollah, um, Khomeini, which was in 1989, uh, we now have the supreme leader, Ayatollah um, Khomeini. So very similar names there, Khomeini. Uh, is the new Ayatollah and leader. He represents fundamentalist mullahs, which are um, Islamic theology and sacred law, uh, a Muslim that learned and practiced that. Does not have the same kind of personality or credentials, but still well respected. And then one of the first presidents under uh, him was uh, one of the more important presidents was Katami. Um, was the head of government. The Ayatollah is considered a political moderate. Okay, so that would be your head of state where the president is your uh, head of government. Uh, and he kind of let some peaceful protests and things happen, uh, freedom of the press, uh, but that has changed back and forth for different presidents. They wanted to end the freeze of the West and block some clerics, but that's kind of controversial as well. So we'll get into that when we talk about some of the leadership.